Now, turn off all the lights and get ready to never sleep again. I survived Canada's scariest corn maze by poltergeists. Every path led back to the scarecrow. Left, right, straight ahead, another left, another right. It didn't matter. Every single path in this so boring it was almost impressive corn maze led back to the stupid fucking scarecrow. And even the word scarecrow was a beyond charitable way to describe a five foot tall stick man made out of literal sticks. A five foot stick for the body and four two foot sticks for the limbs, barely held together with red twine. They even threw a dollar store straw hat on top for good measure. Admittedly, this kindergarten arts and crafts dummy was a fitting mascot for this entire corn maze experience. A cheap stand-in of overdone Halloween cliches all thrown together at the last second. All with glowing online reviews like, I couldn't sleep for days after this one. An absolute mindfuck. And easily the scariest corn maze in Alberta. Never trust online reviews. Rose held up the map while I followed. The only interesting thing about this whole experience was the corn stalks themselves, rising higher than a two-story house on either side. I didn't even know they grew that tall. Rose and I squeezed our way down winding paths as corn scraped against our shoulders on either side. Always a tight fit. Finally, we broke into a painfully familiar four-foot by four-foot circular clearing. Three paths. Three choices. We'd been out here four hours already, and the sun was drifting downward. Okay, I'm like 97% sure this is it, said Rose, pointing to her left. Maybe we'll run into the stick man again. I shook my head. You mean one of a dozen stick men? Hey, fuck you. It's the exact same scarecrow, said Rose, pushing forward. Shrugging, I followed her down the next path. The percussive sound of shuffling corn stalks buzzed around my ears, like a swarm of locusts. Boring Halloween locusts. Thus far, in my highly objective opinion, nothing about this maze had even come close to scary. Creepy? Maybe a little, at first, sure. But after the third scarecrow run-in, Things were getting boring pretty fast. Mind-numbingly boring. 20 minutes for this to get interesting, or I'm calling it, I said, referring to the emergency phone number given to us by the corn maze owner. If y'all find things get too much. She wore an obviously fake eye patch and spoke with an even faker southern drawl. If things get too much, y'all call this number here. Mm-hmm. We'll send help to come and get them. She spat dryly onto the farmhouse porch. All games and fun till nightfall. She shook her head. There's no control in these maze people after dark. Maze people? I physically cringed at this whole operation. Everything felt way too forced. Way too scripted. They even made us sign a stupid fake waiver so we couldn't sue for trauma. As haunted funhouse connoisseurs go, Rose and I had pretty high standards, a fact that only made Rose's enthusiasm all the more frustrating. Usually, she saw right through the bullshit, but this time, she was mesmerized, laughing with giddy excitement every single time we ran into that stupid stick man. Our whole conflict stemmed from one simple disagreement. Rose believed it was the exact same stick man every time, but I knew it was one of many, likely set up by camouflaged workers as we explored. That would explain the occasional rustlings in the fields. That or the so-called maze people. Based on high school math alone, it would have been literally impossible 
for it to be the exact same scarecrow. Unless a corn farmer discovered teleportation ahead of mainstream science. Of course, Rose strongly disagreed. She insisted there was some trickery at play, like an unexplained magic trick. But I ran the numbers. Multiple scarecrows were the only possible explanation. Regardless, this whole dispute would have been settled soon enough. Rose tied a purple bracelet made of plastic flowers around the last scarecrow. If it showed up on the next scarecrow, then... Didn't you make that bracelet back in grade school? I asked. Rose only shrugged. I guess it's time to move on, she said. Rose was a little odd sometimes, but that's why I liked her. Kathy. Rose stopped moving. Up ahead, she whispered. I peered over her shoulder, down the narrow path, about 40 feet away, another sick man scarecrow. This time, it stood upright, lazily twisting back and forth. Fishing wire. Spooky, I said, my voice dripping with sarcasm. Rose ignored me and stepped forward. I followed. Suddenly, the scarecrow collapsed. Fuck! Rose hissed under her breath, genuinely startled. I chuckled. We pushed forward and reached the fallen stick man. Rose bent forward, resting hands on her knees. She breathed a sigh of disappointment. No purple flower bracelet. Multiple scarecrows, I said. I rest my case. Rose squat down and studied the scarecrow. Okay, fine, you win, she said, her voice filled with annoyance. It was getting darker now. Daylight dimming as a red sun pulled down behind the gently swaying corn stalks. We should call it. I sighed. I don't want to be out here when the maze people show up, I said mockingly. Sure said Rose, pushing back up to standing. She pulled out her phone, dialed the emergency number, and set it to speaker. A smooth tone rang out three times until someone answered. Hey, said Rose. It's the girls from earlier. We're stuck out here. No response. We leaned in closer. Now, the sound of breathing. Hushed and frightened breathing. We looked at each other. Uh, you okay? Said Rose. Shh. A voice on the other end hissed. We went quiet. Drowning beneath speakerphone static, staggering footsteps thumped against carpeted floor, getting closer. Whoever held the phone suddenly took a quick breath inward, and the sound of breathing stopped. They were holding their breath. Unknowingly, I held my own breath as well. More silence followed. The faint static of background room tone. More thudding footsteps. An image crossed my mind. The image of a woman hiding under a bed, holding her breath as intruders wandered about the house. Whimpering cries, barely audible. At first, I thought it was the woman, but it wasn't. The people wandering around her house were crying, sniffling and sorrowful, some of them weeping, more thudding footsteps, erratic like a drunk on a stormy ship, each step louder than the last, getting closer, closer, and right beside the phone, more weeping, sniffling and sobbing like an overzealous mourner at a funeral march. Right beside the phone, a short, shuddered exhale. Breathing. Whoever was hiding was no longer holding their breath. Quick and desperate gasp of air until the phone screen went dark. The call went silent. Rose tapped the screen. Nothing. She pressed down the on button. Nothing. Patterie's dead, said Rose. Our eyes met. Is that? <clears throat> I cleared my throat. Do you think that's part of the... I 
I don't know. Let's get back to the car. With newfound urgency, we pushed back down the path from where we came. Nightfall was almost upon us. The slow dim of darkness encroached as shadows soaked up the last pools of sunlight. It's just part of the maze, I kept telling myself. Impressed by the trick. Set up your patrons into thinking it's just another boring Halloween corn maze and then pull the rug out with an elaborate bait and switch. But the phone call sounded real. Too real. More convincing than any haunted house we'd ever been to. And we'd been to a lot. We rounded another corner and Rose suddenly lurched to a stop so sudden I nearly bailed into her. Kathy, she hissed. I peered over her shoulder. About ten feet down the pathway lay the stick man, but that didn't concern me. What concerned me stood about ten feet past that, a man over seven feet tall, with his back to us, naked and dirt-stained, with red twine wrapped around his body, red twine digging into his skin with tight crisscross patterns, his head encased by a spherical birdcage, a bird cage made of bent sticks and twine. Inside the cage, over a dozen black sparrows frenzied about his head, desperately trying to escape. Some of them packing and clawing at his blood and shit-stained head. If this guy worked for the corn maze, he'd get an A-plus for visual effects and a criminal record for animal abuse. But if this guy didn't work for the corn maze... Okay, you got us, said Rose, trying and failing to sound calm. We're fucking terrified. Can you show us the way out now? No response. Only the sound of frantic birds. Rose stepped backward, bumping into me. Sorry, she whispered. I didn't respond. I was paralyzed, hypnotized, by the dreadful sight of a man with a spherical birdcage wrapped around his head. Surreal almost like a painting. Suddenly, one of the sparrows burst into flame, then another one, and another one. The fire spread from bird to bird, passing around the cage like rapid contagion. The man groaned in pain, slowly reached up, and pulled at the cage. Burning sparrows circled his head like murderous hornets all the while. He wailed in agony, barely sounding human twisting and withering as he desperately yanked on the cage. Finally, the cage snapped open and the sparrows burst out like shrapnel and slammed into the corn stalks on either side. Crawling flames shot up the walls with surprising speed. I don't remember turning around. I don't even remember the first ten seconds of running, but there I was, suddenly sprinting faster than I'd ever sprint before high school track and field included. Rose was right on my heels, or at least I assumed she was. From behind, a monstrous wall of fire chased us, and the tortured screams of the birdcage man echoed, the scorching breath of imminent and painful death gasping on our backs. Up ahead, a fork in the path. Fuck. I didn't think about it. My legs picked up speed and I slammed headfirst into the wall of corn stalks, frantically shoving my way forward as dry stalks slapped and clawed against my face, my hair literally melting from the waves of looming heat. This is it. I'm going to die. The fire climbed above me and glowing ash fell like apocalyptic rain. I was screaming and terrified and I tumbled forward breaking out into an open field of fresh air. I scrambled to my feet and rushed ahead. I climbed a grassy slope and collapsed to the ground, coughing and hacking my lungs out as I stared up at the star-filled skies. Rose! I snapped up to sitting. She wasn't there. I pushed up to standing. Rose! Movement. Down by the edge of the burning cornfield. Rose, covered in ash, was army crawling away from the fire. I shot down the hill and hauled towards her. The heat was unimaginable, like sticking your face into a running oven. Rose was unconscious by the time I reached her. 
I grabbed her by the torso and dragged her away. I dragged her up the slope and collapsed onto my side, exhausted and barely breathing, head resting on my outstretched arms. My vision was fading, cornfields aflame down below, orange glow cast upon the night sky as dancing flames spread further and further. The farmhouse, sat on a slope across the cornfield, was burning too. A separate fire? My eyes grew heavy and the world dimmed and everything went dark. I awoke in a greenish-white hospital room, oxygen mask gripped to my face and random tubes stuck in my arm. Rose? I whispered, still barely awake. Your friend's going to be okay, a calming voice replied, and I passed out again. When I woke up, Rose was seated beside me. How are you already out of bed I said kind of annoyed Rose smiled and chugged Irish luck rolling my eyes I coughed a little how long have I been out two days yikes I shifted my weight slightly and stabbing pain shot up my side oof be careful said Rose you got some nasty burns on your back shit I said settling back down doctor wants to keep you here a while don't worry nothing too serious thank god i said i was starting to regret going back for you rose chuckled we always shared the same sense of morbid humor memories of the corn maze suddenly came flooding back what did the cops say about the corn maze i blinked at her what else would it be she looked down at the ground they don't buy it fire department's still running a full investigation but right now they don't seem too concerned seriously yep said rose i think i lost them at spontaneously combusting sparrows i almost laughed what about the house i asked the eye patch lady they didn't find any bodies what the fuck that about sums it up, she said, crossing her arms and leaning back into the chair. There's one good thing, though. She turned back to me. I'd say we got our money's worth. I chuckled, and more pain shot up my side. Fuck you, don't make me laugh. My bad, said Rose, turning red and looking down at the floor. A silence followed, but it wasn't awkward. We'd been friends since grade school. We're comfortable with silence. Kathy, said Rose, looking up and gently taking my hand. Sorry to be a sentimental sob, but thank you for coming back. I nodded quietly, finding it hard to speak, but I saw the deep gratitude in her eyes, and that was enough. I know she'd have done the same for me. She smiled again and glanced down at her arm, then back up at me. My eyes drifted downward, and... I saw something that filled me with uncanny dread so strange. It was incomprehensible. Wrapped around Rose's wrist, the purple bracelet made of plastic flowers. Greetings, spoils and ghouls. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more, subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss out. If you have a request or suggestion, make sure to leave them in the comment section below. We hope you enjoyed this video, and remember to stay spooky.